I've fallen in love with early medieval archery and the early medieval period and today I thought we'd make this. This is a quiver based on the Hebity Grave. It is fantastic, really enjoyable and I really hope you watch this video. I'm so looking forward to sharing it with you. That's all coming up. guys so basically what happened was some friends and I were talking about early medieval archery equipment having watched the Lars Anderson video some years ago in the video Lars says that um, quivers were just a Hollywood myth which is complete rubbish there's one on the Bayou tapestry let's take a quick look The question is, what's this guy using? So I decided to do some research and we found a bunch of different quivers which were possible. One of which is an arrow, uh, an arrow bag, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And the other one is uh, a heavy type quiver. Uh, to be honest with you, I'd never heard of this quiver. So I was really quite excited to, to find it and to, um, to do my research on it. Unfortunately, uh, I've had to do that all online because of the virus, but here we go. So what's the archaeological evidence for this quiver? Well, it's based on a grave find and in it essentially there are components of which archaeologists have interpreted as being a minimum two, possibly as many as four or five quivers of this type of nature and they've developed a pattern based on that. We'll come back to that in a second. So this is an arrow bag. We mentioned that a couple of seconds ago. Essentially, this is made from coarse linen. It has a leather divider, or this one does, not all of them do. And basically, you can wear this in a bunch of different ways, which it makes it a very versatile item, and I really like these. I'll be making one uh, in a couple of weeks' time. I really love the versatility of this and how well it can be worked. You can, for instance, close the collar up and help protect the arrows from the environment. And also helps protect the feathers um, from damage during transit. I would imagine, and we have no, rec no evidence whatsoever to say how weapons and supplies like this, uh, combat supplies, would have been moved by, for instance, the Saxons hundreds of miles in just a short period of time to face war with Harold Hadrada. I would imagine that wagon loads of these sorts of things would have been thrown onto the um, into convoys and moved from the uh, the fjords moved from the anglo-saxon burrs to uh, to the site of the battle i really love the versatility of this you can sling it over your shoulder you can wear it um, just over one shoulder over two you can tie it into the small of your back um, it's just such a versatile item. When I'm using these, I'll take a whole bunch of them down to the range with me. Uh, I really love it, so I can just lean these up and it's just really, really easy to use. Uh, I just love the flexibility of them. The whole point is that there's a whole bunch of different types of quivers that a person might use. For instance, I might use a back quiver in a closed environment. So a close environment such as um, you know, castles or urban areas, that kind of thing. Very, very good for defensive environments and that way that I can move around my position without actually having to pick up loads of arrows. Uh, I do have a bunch that I can work with and then I might, for instance, cache bunches of arrows around so that I can refill my quiver as I need to. A side quiver like this I personally find very useful when it comes to things like moving through the bush, um, 
as long as the vegetation is not over crazy, then I find this a really, really manageable way to work. Um, and I, I think drawing on my own personal military experience, if I come across someone who's, who's running and doing something stupid and crazy, that person attracts my attention. Whereas if I see people who are just moving around, then it, you actually don't attract as much attention. And so if you can move deliberately with a sense of purpose between points of cover, then as an archer, you can do devastating damage to your enemy and they'll never know you're even there. Righto, so based on the archeological evidence, let's take a look at the pattern. Now, if we interpret the items that are found in the Hebity Quirra, they look essentially something like this. You have a collar piece, which looks like so. Again, I'm not drawing this to scale and I'm no kind of artist. Right, now we then have the main quiver itself, which comes down pretty much like so with two pieces which I'm going to affectionately call ears that come out this way. Now we'll talk more about some of these specific components individually as we go through the project. And there's some detailing, basic detailing which comes down the front. And I think that's pretty much, much it. Um, So this quiver was actually made from three components. You had one which came across the back, you had uh, the front piece, and then you had this piece here which was separate with the tooling marks on it. Um, and then you have these two ears and the collar. So what's that actually? Six pieces. All right, now let's talk some dimensions. So interpreting the find as best we possibly can, we know This dimension here to be 16 centimeters, this one to be 20, a total height of 61 centimeters and a diameter of nine centimeters across the, uh, the quiver itself. Now there is no way of knowing whether these particular quivers were slung from a belt or from a, um, or from the back. Uh, there's this simply the strapping just didn't survive that well. Now in terms of materials uh, we're talking vegetable tanned leather. Uh, there's no other real way of doing something like this. Uh, it, would, it would have to be vegetable tanned leather. Colours. Colours are an interesting topic. Um, there is strong evidence throughout the whole medieval period that people loved colour. Um, and people could achieve colours such as the yellows with um, using marigold, greens through matter, blues through uh, another plant called woad. There's so many different options and you can come out with some really striking and really quite bold colours. And we see colours being used in types of woodwork. We know about the, the, the famous Viking cart, for instance, that would have been red and black originally. Uh, and, and much of this sort of thing had bold colours because people um, used that to kind of uh, tell everyone they were coming. Especially people of notability or, or royalty, perhaps they were wealthy, um, or perhaps they were a famous warrior. I want you to know who I am. I want you to be aware of who you're coming up against. Uh, so people may use bold colours in this kind of way to stand out. I think a quiver such as this may very well have been coloured, but there's no archaeological evidence for that. We can't prove that. But it's very plausible and it's very possible. And certainly the technologies existed at the time. In order to make something like this, we have to construct what's called a last. A last is basically a, a wooden device, I suppose, used to build things like shoes 
and I guess sort of hollow items, that kind of thing. Sorry, I'm not very technical on this particular subject, but it's really useful to do, and I'm making a whole bunch of these, so the last was, was quite credible to do. Any kind of woodworking project like this, you really do need the correct PPE on that is personal protective equipment. That is glasses, a mask, and ear defenders. We're just going to leave that to dry and see what happens. To give you a guide, it is approximately 9 centimeters in diameter. So I'm, so I'm talking about this circle here. And it is 61 centimeters long. That is according to the, uh, the, the stats or the, the information that I've managed to get from the museum. So now what I'm going to do is just reduce this down to... Uh, to nine centimeters in diameter and then I'm going to reduce it again to suit the, the uh, I guess the, the next part of the curvature. Let's get on with that. This is now the last, which is covered in just ordinary, um, what do you call it, masking tape. And what we're doing is we've measured up just over 30 centimeters as per the original one. So there we go, that's what we've got. The back piece, the front piece, and the small triangle piece. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna transfer that onto leather and we'll start cutting. Rightio, so a little bit of time has passed, however, um, I've had a lot of other stuff going on. The website is now up and running, we've got an Etsy store on the way, there's so much going on. Uh, we're starting to build a bit more in terms of Twitter presence and uh, we're expanding the Facebook community, everything's going really well. So unfortunately I've had to uh, park this project for a little bit, but now we're back and we should be able to make some good progress over the next day or two. Alrighty, so. We've got our pattern now cut out. Now what we're gonna do is start cutting out the leather. Right, so we've now transferred our pattern onto the, the leather. Now we're just gonna cut the leather down. One thing I'll just mention quickly is that I like to use a nice brand new sharp blade on each project that I do. When you're trying to cut a straight edge, it's best to use a straight edge. Um, this process is called beveling. I like to bevel all my edges. It just gives you a much nicer, more professional look. Alrighty, so now we're gonna go through with a hole punch and we're gonna punch out all of our holes for stitching. Uh, I use a four in one hole punch. Uh, again, no, this was not period. Just in case anyone thinks that. Um, again though, the stitches are an amazingly, they're close together, they're very consistent. So whoever did this was, was a very experienced leather worker and was able to create very, very, very professional results. And I simply say my hat off to them. I can't seem to, uh, to get that sort of skill level, so I'm doing the best I can with, with what I have. Alrighty, so these are the pattern pieces we've now got cut out. We'll just quickly go through them. Obviously you've got the top here, which we're gonna do some tooling on in a second. We have got the base, we have got, this is the piping that will go around the front piece and that sits roughly there. And this is the rest of the top section. This is the, um, the piping that will go around the quiver itself, joining the front and rear sections. 
the next step we're going to do is the tooling. Okay, there's not very much tooling on this. Now the way I do my tooling is I just moisten the leather down. It's a pretty warm day here in, in Brisbane, Australia. You don't want it wet, but you want it more than damp, so to speak. And the idea is that the, the leather will take the pattern. Righto. Now, on the actual original Hebity Quiver, the only tooling is just this little bit of uh, indentation marks on the very front. They don't seem to have been particularly measured. So what I'm doing is I'm just using a piece of tracing paper initially just to get my, uh, my markings down. And then I'm using a stylus, what's called a stylus, to transcribe those indentations onto the leather. Now, as I said, it's a bit of a warm day here in Brisbane. So it's a little bit of a uh, feat, I guess, to just... Now, I then just going over this fairly lightly, actually, with what they call a swivel knife. And the purpose of that is really just to um, enhance the indentations and marking on the actual quiver. You don't need to be too crazy rough with this, it's just... Okay, all of that's now done. Now we're going to do the stitching. Alrighty, now what we're going to do is just put the front pieces together. Now this is a little bit complicated and it doesn't quite makes sense the way you might think. The, the original, interestingly enough, um, a, appears to have been molded in such a way that the piping stands out slightly. The only way that I can think that they achieved that was to put some kind of cordage inside the leather whilst it was being sewn together, like so. Now there's no evidence to support that because we're talking something that happened 1200 years ago. However, um, and so the, the evidence appears to have deteriorated away, but that's, that, that's what I think, that's the conclusion that I've been able to reach. So I'm going to stitch all of these elements together in one single go. Uh, once you get going, it's not too bad. It's, it's just a little bit fiddly. Uh, I use a waxed linen thread, uh, which I find works really well for me. You don't need to go kind of all out with it. Um, and it's probably pretty close to what they would have used on the original era. So, you simply need to line up your pieces. Right, you go. I tend to start a few stitches down, so to speak. And then just line everything up. Bear in mind, you might be changing a few things as you go through so just allow for a little bit of flexibility in your design. I So when I'm sewing these things together I tend to use a running back stitch. What that means is I just sew with one needle all the way in one direction and then I come back and sew the other way in the other direction. Now I find it works really well for me. It's a really strong stitch. It comes out very similar to a saddle stitch it can be a little bit of a pain in the butt. Now, um, depending on the outcome you're looking for, you've got to be a little bit careful here because um, with the just sewing the leather, the nature of sewing sewing something so thick is that um, you risk damaging the the facing of the leather. So um, you may want to put down like a towel or a piece of cloth or something to sort of stop any scratching that might occur. Um, I use a blunt needle. Uh, I have always sewn leather with blunt needles. 
So that works for me. Now you'll find the, the sewing leather like this can be a bit of a challenge because it's so thick. Usually you've got two layers of 1.5mm, you've got two layers of 2.5mm, so then you've got like 8mm, that's roughly a third of an inch worth of leather I'm trying to sew through. Um, so you do need to be a bit patient and you need to go, like this is where the preparation comes in of making sure all your holes line up and getting everything right that way. Otherwise it can be a real challenge to get everything done nice and neatly. Alright, so this is the front section which is now nearly complete. So we have the piping here and we have this the front section we tooled earlier and then you have the top all sewn together. It's come out really well. Very happy with that. Now uh, the next thing is to join the front and the, the rear together. Just going to show you a couple of things very carefully. And you should be able to see as well how thick that is compared to like my fingers. It's actually quite a lot of leather there. It's not so much the weight, it's really just the thickness. So having the holes pre-punched actually makes this, this whole thing so much easier and, and, and manageable and achievable. Alrighty, so I'm going to get this up finished and then we're going to get on with the... Oops. Rightio, I'm going to get this section finished a little bit tidied up and then we'll get on with the rest of the stitching. So the collar's a really interesting piece. Um, the original has a really amazing kind of, or how it's been interpreted anyway, is the original has this really amazing piece of water formed leather which has survived. At least one of the collars has survived in, in part. So to recreate that, at least as best as I possibly can, um, I've chosen to do it this way. Now, what I've done is I've glued onto an old piece of radiata pine just some dowel, and then I filled in the blanks with some putty. This should work. I'm really interested to see how this goes. Wet forming leather is an interesting process. Um, you have to soak the leather. Now, I've got a piece of, uh, I'm using... I think it's 1.5 millimeter leather, that's roughly speaking five ounce. What we're going to do is we've soaked it for around about five minutes. Now let's have a quick look and see how it's going. Right, yeah, so we have this piece of very wet, uh, roughly speaking, five ounce leather. Now I'm just going to clamp this in place. I understand the clamping process is going to, well it achieves the, the aim, I guess, of holding the leather in place, but What it, what it doesn't do is, and you're just basically using the edges of your fingers, running that along the sides of the dowel. You can use tooling, but you've got to be very careful. Be very wary of things like fingernails. And you just slowly work your way around. And the idea is that you create an, a, an impression on the leather which is going to, uh, as the leather dries, you'll have a, a really nice impression. Another really good way to do this is vacuum forming, and I think that's how they do it commercially. Um, but obviously, techniques like vacuum forming didn't exist back in the medieval period. I'm trying to do my very best to recreate what was there, or, or how this was likely to be produced. It's very, very difficult to know. The quality of workmanship is, is really quite amazing um, on the original. Therefore, you have to sort of wonder how it was achieved. Um, obviously by someone who's better at leather work than I am, but... Alrighty, so the molding process is done. Now what I'm going to do is punch some holes down the side and stitch it together uh, and then dye it. Leave that to one side while it dries and then um, we'll be dyeing the... Uh, I just do this very simple zigzag stitch. I just It's a two needle technique. I don't often sew with two needles. Um, 
it's a little bit of an alien concept to me. I prefer to sew with a single needle. Um, in this case, I'm using a blunt needle or blunt needles with um, waxed linen thread, which I find works really great. Just be a little bit careful of fingernails and that kind of thing because they can scar the leather. Otherwise, it's uh, it's a pretty simple technique. Doesn't take too long, and you come up with this fairly functional anyway. Um, X pattern for your, your stitching. I use this for sword scabbards and all that kind of thing. Alrighty, that's exactly what we're looking for. Nice butted edges, simple zigzag, a, a um, X pattern stitch. When you come to the end, you just do a simple knot, cut off the excess that goes in the bin. It's only worth like a couple of cents. And then I just use a lighter and just singe off the edges. Radio. Now we're just going to dye that. Radio. When it comes to dyeing your project, uh, I use a dye by a company called Maclace Leather. This is just really easy, to, super easy to apply. It's actually easier to apply when your wool leather is slightly wet and you don't get as many tide marks. You may want to do a couple of coats. I wear gloves when I'm doing mine so that my hands don't turn brown. It looks a bit weird when you've had a school pickup and you've got brown hands. Right, I'm just going to leave that to dry now for the rest of the day. That's exactly where I was wanting to be today. There we go. So I'm choosing to use a, a light brown colour here. And I'm going to contrast this with a darker brown. I, I certainly think coloured pigments such as green and red would have been reserved very strictly for royalty, but they did exist. Um, so, for example, we know that the, the famous wooden cart was actually black and red. Um, and there's some other items we know of that would have been. You may need to apply a couple of coats of dye just to get a good even finish. I'm going to use a product called Antique at this point, just as that um, dye just dries off. Now Antique finish, this is um, Finnegan's medium brown Antique finish. It comes on with a consistency, something like Vegemite. So it's, it's quite a thick pasty kind of stuff and you just really rub it in. Don't go crazy with it. Um, probably a bit more than that. And then we just wipe that off. And what that does is it helps the tooling marks to stand out really as much as anything. Right go. Now we're just going to use the dark brown, as I say, you shouldn't need crazy amounts. If you do get, uh, if you do make a mistake and you end up with dye where you don't want it, you can use like water-based paints and stuff to cover up your work. And there's a few techniques out there on the internet for cleaning up those kind of mistakes as well. Um, but it's probably best just to avoid making a mistake if you can in the first place. No one's perfect. I'm not perfect, that's for sure. That's the dyeing now complete. I'm pretty happy with that. There's a few little minor errors. As I say, no one's perfect. So, I'm not um, overstressed about that. But that's come up really well. Now I'm just going to do, uh, now I'm just going to put on a, a clear leather sealer. Uh, from from Mac Lace. Now these guys are these, these are pretty good. I really like the uh, the clear sealer. What it does is it helps protect the leather work from you know UV light and some of that kind of stuff. Bit of damage from rain, which 
which you're going to get uh, at medieval events. They just somehow seem to be a bit kind of go together. And it also protects it from sweat and abrasion and things like that. So there we go. Alrighty, and we're all done. That looks pretty damn amazing. Really, 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 really happy with that. The way that's come out. Um, let's uh, let's put some arrows in it. See what happens. Alrighty, guys. All finished. All done. Now you could actually put this in two different ways. You could sling this uh, over the back, and I'm going to make at least a few like that. You could also have this as a belt quiver, which is what I've done in this particular instance. And that's how the majority of these that I've seen have been interpreted. The archaeological evidence just isn't there to say how it would have been done in the day. So there's a whole bunch of different possibilities and who knows, maybe uh, maybe this could be, could be a back quiver, we don't know. All finished, all done. I'm really, really, really happy with this. This has come out amazingly well. I love the coloration. It's bold, it's striking, it's contrasting, it's really good. Um, I love the way that I can just draw arrows out as I need them. It's fantastic. It's a, it's a really nice thing. Um, and I'm really looking forward to taking this down to the range in a couple of days time. Hopefully get a bit of range time down there with my kids over the holidays too. So, uh, alrighty guys, I really hope you've enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.